So we already get a synopsis of how horrible private equity is and what they have done to us as uh, citizens in this country. Uh, just to get your thoughts at first about private equity, what are your thoughts about these, you know, how they operate within this country game? Um, like Parenti says, Michael Parenti was like, the costs are socialized, but the, the profits are pri privatized, you know? And like these folks, these scumbags, they don't really, uh, they obviously don't care about us, but they don't want a bigger chunk of the cake or pie. They want the entire thing and they'll do anything they apps anything they can to privatize like utilities um hospitals libraries um transportation like you name it dude they want everything they want everything privatized and um we ha we pay for it man and then they have like a safety net the government can just bail them out if they're playing hot potato on the market and just like playing with our lives but it's like they have a safety net you know it's really really screwed up man so uh bring out the guillotines i guess um <laughs> but um yeah man like um my city is just ridiculous like it's expanding so much and like all these new little suburbs man like i swear like only like a third of them are available to buy and like the other two-thirds part of that little suburb it's all rent man you can only rent and um i'm worried like would i if i'll ever be able to own a home um i'm not good at saving money I don't make a ton, um, but it's like, yeah, it is definitely worrisome that uh, my girlfriend and I can like, get a house at some point. So, um, yeah. That sucks. Because a lot of times people are going to go, well, you don't have to worry because if you don't own it, then that means that the responsibility is on the landlords to be able to make sure that the house is maintained, right? Right? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> This video is entitled, I Investigate America's Most Evil Slumlord. Here's what happened. It's bad. The outlets weren't working. Our ceiling fan had caught on fire. That's all you gotta do. Rats and roaches for three years. You know, I can't, I can't imagine having the same issue this summer where it gets up to 96 degrees and now I have a baby and having to be stuck in the house. I'm waiting for one of us to just fall through a floor. It felt like a halfway house. I hate to say it. They know, like they know there's nowhere we can go. So Chris Hedges had on uh, a guest and talking about private equity recently. And I think it's important that we find out what private equity is and why uh, private equity is such a, is such an enemy of the people. Why is it that private equity really needs, in my view, needs to be outlawed in this country? because it will do none of us any good at all keeping it in place. It, you know, and you guys you know, don't realize how much private equity actually touches you know, your, your lives. Uh, so I'm just gonna start here because Chris Hedges actually gives a synopsis of what private equity is, and then we will go through just a few of these. I'm not going to be watching this entire video, but and also, if you wish, please uh, stop me, you know, so that if you want to add something in it as well. Equity firms buy up and plunder businesses, piling on debt, refusing to reinvest, slashing staff, and often driving companies into bankruptcy. The object is not to sustain businesses, but to harvest them for assets to make a short-term profit. Those who run these firms, such as Leon Black, Henry Kravis, Stephen Schwartzman, and David Rubenstein, have amassed personal fortunes in the billions of dollars. The wreckage they orchestrate is taken out on workers who lose jobs or see salaries and benefits slashed, taken out on pension funds that are depleted because of usurious fees for abolished, and on our health and safety. Residents of nursing homes, for example, owned by private equity firms, experience 10% more deaths because of staffing shortages 
and reduced compliance with standards of care. Private equity owns hospitals and has created a health crisis. Nursing shortages have contributed to one of every four unexpected hospital deaths or injuries caused by errors. The private equity firms do not serve patients, but profits. They have closed hospitals, especially in rural America. They cut back on stockpiles of vital, vital medical devices, including ventilators and personal protective equipment. In 1975, the U.S. had about 1.5 million hospital beds and a population of about 216 million people. Now, with a population of over 330 million people, we have around 925,000 beds. 56% of Americans have medical debt, even though many have insurance, and 23% owe $10,000 or more. Emergency room visits and emergency rooms are often run by private equity firms, contributed to medical debt for 44% of Americans. At the same time, the healthcare system, because of this slash and burn assault, was unprepared to handle the COVID epidemic, seeing 330,000 Americans die during the pandemic because they could not afford to go to a doctor on time. These private equity firms, like an invasive species, are ubiquitous. They have acquired educational institutions, utility companies, and retail chains, while bleeding taxpayers of hundreds of billions in subsidies, made possible by bought and paid for prosecutors, politicians, and regulators. Joining me to discuss private equity. So we already get a synopsis of how horrible private equity is and what they have done to us as uh, citizens in this country. Uh, just to get your thoughts at first about private equity, what are your thoughts about these, you know, how they operate within this country game? Um. Like Parenti says, Michael Parenti was like, the costs are socialized, but the, the profits are pri privatized, you know? And like these folks, these scumbags, they don't really, uh, they obviously don't care about us, but they don't want a bigger chunk of the cake or pie. They want the entire thing. And they'll do anything they, abs anything they can to privatize, like utilities, um, hospitals, libraries, um, transportation like you name it dude they want everything they want everything privatized and um we ha we pay for it man and then they have like a safety net the government can just bail them out if they're playing hot potato on the market and just like playing with our lives but it's like they have a safety net you know it's really really screwed up man so um yeah Absolutely. Now we're going to hear about how they work. So let's go here. And pensions, as you pointed out. Explain how they work, because it's all about debt. Um, and, right. and what's interesting from your book is that they actually don't put very much money. That's but right. I'll let you explain just the mechanics of it. Okay. These firms, first of all, they raise money for their buyouts. They don't use a lot of their own money for those buyouts. What they do is they go to public pensions, they go to endowments, they go to the big institutional investors and say, we're putting together a fund, we're going to buy out companies, we're going to make them more efficient, and then we're going to sell them in five to seven years at a profit, and you will be able to reap those gains along with us. But yes, as you point out, the private equity titans do not put a lot of their money, of their own money at stake here. Um, one to two percent of these funds are typically the private equity firm's money. So after they have raised the money, they go out and look for companies to buy. And they um, really home in on companies that have assets that they can strip. Assets. These are often physical assets that they can sell. Physical assets like real estate. Now, you pointed out that they've taken over a lot of retailers. When that was going on, often they would be buying retailers that had, you know, either very, very favorable leases or actually had land underneath their stores that they could then sell at a profit stripping the company. It's really not about operating the company, as you say. It's really about stripping the assets, uh, extracting the money they can from it. It's an extraction 
business. So they buy a company, they then find out how they can make it more efficient, um, which means usually firing many people, um, stripping the assets, selling them off. And sometimes they sell the assets and they get all their money back initially, very, very early on in the process. And what's left really is a carcass. What's left is a company that has now got enormous amounts of debt piled on top of it. These, these transactions are funded by debt, but it's not the private equity firm that takes on the debt. It's the company they're buying. So if they buy a retailer, they'll put a load of debt on that retailer. Suddenly that retailer has way higher costs of operating, which means that then they have to cut costs elsewhere, fire people, deplete pensions. It's really a game where a very narrow slice of people win and a huge circle of pain of losers is involved every day. So basically is how capitalism is run, right? Free market, baby. Yep. Whatever it takes. And so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just going to say that's how it ultimately it always is, is that it's the people who have the capital at first, who may have gotten it through exploitative means, and then they continuously exploit people and extract so that they can make more and screw everybody else. This is also always what happens with a lot of people. Like for instance, I used to work at Sears and this is what happened with Sears, how they're continuously extracting more and more, cutting, 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 cutting so that they can make more money. And then by the time uh, it's all over, then Sears has to declare bankruptcy because they can't do it anymore. And then it, you know, thousands of workers have lost their jobs. Uh, they sold off all the land. And then who makes out like bandits for the people who are in private equity that actually owned everything. And so, and private equity leads to the contribution of lower quality when it comes to goods, services, medical care, um, from the food you eat, because private equity is involved in the food you eat, private equity is involved in the cars you buy, they're involved with the TVs you watch, they're involved with the phones you use. Private equity is everywhere. They're even involved in the homes you live in. So it is, private equity is bad. Um, let me see here. Let's finish this part and then we will go to the next point. Everybody else is on the losing end. Well, when because it's about short-term profit, um, you have an example in the book about uh, a nursing home system. Okay, so that's uh, that's the, the next part I wanna go to, I got you here. Um, here we go, let's go there. All right, so let's go to this next part because it's really just money laundering to me. Well, the nursing home. You call these private equity firms, these are your words, money spinning machines. Before we go into specifics, talk about, because the, the amounts are staggering. I mean, we can talk about the charming, is it Leon Black? Um, the, 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 these people are bringing in personally, you know, the, these figures, billions upon billions of dollars. Talk about the amount of money they're, they're generating. The net worths of the people running these companies are in the tens of billions. Um, in the COVID years, I think Steve Schwarzman's, um, he is the head of Blackstone. I think his net worth doubled during COVID. Um, I think it went up to something like 35 billion or something. And How many of us have actually fared worse during the pandemic? Game, how, how, how did you fare during the pandemic? Did, your, did, you, did things get better for you or worse? 
Uh, my job, uh, I'm an exterminator. So, like, I was like a, uh, what do you call it? A crucial or a business that needs to stay open or something. So, I mean, but like, people were so scared to, you know, get services because you got to come in the house, right, to do stuff. And uh, definitely business did, did slow down. And um, we had the CARES Act passed, right? And how much upward transfer of wealth was that? You know, we totally got shafted on that one. So, yeah, I did not horrible, but I definitely didn't do good. I don't know. How did you do? Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, it's happened to a lot of us, you know, so, you know, continuously doing horrible. But thank you very much for that perspective. Let's continue. Anyway, uh, these companies extract e enormous fees for their operation. They extract fees from the pension funds that invest with them. But I just want to interrupt you because the, the deal is they get the pension funds to invest because supposedly the pension funds will make a profit. Right. But then as you read in the book, they force the pension funds to pay them management fees. Right. And you have cases in the book where they're not even doing anything. Right. But I think if I remember, they're pulling like 10%. I mean, a lot of money. And, and so let's go to the next part that a lot of people actually i think this part is really important so let's get this part it talks about secrecy you write that they operate in secrecy uh with hidden ties to companies they control um the wreckage they leave behind is often difficult to track back to its origins and i just want to raise another uh, point that you do in the book, you, you and I thought it was you know important that many Americans who are being assaulted this way, they know some, something's wrong, but they don't quite know what is wrong. And I think it's tied to this almost invisible hand. Uh, but explain that, and then I, then I want you to talk about their political clout because it's significant. They they get the the tax breaks. They you know they they corrupt the system enough to essentially grease the skids for them to continue to operate absolutely so before she answers uh game let me let me ask you this is it the person that's crossing the border the reason why a regular worker's life let's say in ohio that their life is that bad no <laughs> they're crossing the border because uh, we bombed the hell out of their country and turned it into a capitalist hellhole man Central America, South America, we, so many covert actions and so many like just rounding up leftist communists, man, just so corporate capital penetration can move in there. And then that's not earthquakes, not like extreme weather or drought. No, it's us putting these countries in destitution. And that's why those people are coming across the border. But um, yeah. And then they ship our jobs off overseas, right? Like they open. They don't pay somebody fifteen dollars an hour here. They open something in Indonesia for like fifty cents an hour. That's get mad at the corporations, man. Not not your neighbor. So yeah, yep. Yeah. So they operate in secrecy because they don't want you to know that it's them. It, 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 it's it's like it's like he who smelt it dealt it, right? <laughs> Let's continue. Absolutely. Um, so the secrecy is important. You know, one of the reasons that we wanted to write this book is to let people know how pervasive this business model is. Well, you write at one point that all of us, although we don't know it, are engaging with private equity yes. firms. But so talk about how extensive it is and then talk about that secrecy too. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I write in the book, um, you know, the coffee and donut that you pick up on the way to work, the uh, child care entity where you drop your son or daughter off, the nursing home where your mother or father lives. I mean, it is cradle to grave, literally, you're impacted by private equity. But you don't know it because these are just companies that they're buying and selling, but you don't know who the real owner is behind the scenes and they like it that way they want to keep it that way because they 
operate best in secrecy. They're private companies. They don't have to make filings to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so a lot of the business and a lot of their practices are hidden from view. And that is by design. One of the things that I think could improve um, the, our perception or educate people about how pervasive private equity has become is to force th these firms to identify themselves as the owners. So it should be the Carlisle nursing home or the Blackstone um, you know, donut shop or whatever, just so you are aware of who you're um, dealing with and whose, you know, uh, pocket you're putting your money into. Now, the secrecy is one thing. Um, the political clout is, as you say, immense because they have so much money. I mean, their tax treatment is an outrage and many people many presidents have tried to change it but have not been able to Can do you explain so. what it is what the tax so there's so much more to this and i really wanted to get into it but for the sake of time uh, i can't but i'm going to put this link to this uh video in the chat so that you guys can look at it. Um, but there's more to talk about in regards to private equity and how they are really just anti-human, anti-worker. Um, so let me share this as well. Um, there is a particular article that has came out. And I showed this a little bit, but I wanna make sure that, you know, we nail this down. So this is out of the Tampa Bay Times. Um, it talks about how corporate investors are taking over Tampa Bay neighborhoods. Experts say the outsized impact of just a handful of companies can squeeze individual buyers out of the housing market. So even in housing, so I already read some of this. It says corporate investors own 27,000 homes across Tampa Bay. And so it says these companies have fueled a growing single family rental market, which proponents say creates more options for those who can't afford to buy. But while investors are not to blame for their region's inflated rental and home prices, experts say they exacerbate the issue with tactics that shut out individual buyers. This proportionate concentration of ownership among a handful of companies has been linked to rising rent and sales costs, as well as neglected property maintenance and higher eviction rates. They drive up prices and lower the housing supply. They're affecting people's everyday life now. Families like Morris are caught in the crosshairs. In such a costly and competitive market, she fears that her three children may not get the same opportunity for home ownership. She said, I'm thankful that I do not have to look for a home at these prices right now. I don't know how anybody can make it. So there's a lot of people that are now not unable to own homes. And this reminds me of what they say at the World Economic Forum own nothing and be happy, right? So this isn't just limited to Tampa. Here's uh, another article out of the Orlando Sentinel talking about what's happening in Orlando. This is out of the Orlando Sentinel says investment firms snap up homes in Metro Orlando, driving up prices. So, says Raymond was a featured speaker at Congressional Subcommittee. Says a survey by the committee showed up a top five U.S. single family rental companies have increased their holdings by 27% on average since 2018, with first key in progress growing more than 60% over that time. Keep in, mind, keep in mind that name progress. 
says Raymond says she's concerned about the way the purchases affect the market overall. Investors are paying higher prices for homes, usually with cash, which beat out the offers of for many mortgage buyers. In Metro Orlando, the median price investors paid was three hundred ten thousand in twenty twenty one seen as medium for home buyers overall. The range in prices was largely tied to where the homes, homes were brought. A proxy company for Amherst Group, which owns Main Street Renewal, snagged a home in Apopka for 215000 while a company connected to Progress brought south of Windermere for 616000 Just to let you guys know, Windermere is one of the more wealthy areas in Orlando or Orange County. <clears throat> So they are buying up homes all over this country and making us into a nation of renters so that we no longer will be able to own anything, meaning it is changing us into a nation of serfs, a nation of renters, and uh, it's going to create it into a nation of company towns. It's just, and, and my question is, game, do you, you know, are you able to own your own home? Absolutely you not. <laughs> Absolutely not. I live in Austin, right. Texas, and um, okay. this was the fastest growing city in the world in the start of the pandemic for like a year or two. Everything's ridiculous, dude. Um, rent it went up like 40% for everything. It's just ridiculous here. But yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. It's really bad. Yeah. So, um, by the way, shout out to Roger Meadows for sharing this information with me. Um, to Chris Hedges, uh, piece as well as this one. So let's take a look here as well. Stunning new details tonight on Georgia's housing crisis. A GSU study says. 19,000 homes, not apartments, homes in the metro are owned by three companies. That's nearly one in every nine houses up for rent and some entire suburban neighborhoods where corporations own it all. Channel 2's Michael Doudna is live in Paulding County. And Michael, this is important because it drives up prices for everyone. Yeah, when you're talking about tens of thousands of homes involved here, well, it can make an impact, meaning that homes that you see like this one that would originally been a starter home about a decade or so ago are now for lease. Signs in front yards showing not a home for sale, but for rent. Atlanta has more of these types of properties than the next couple of, of metro areas combined. These properties are single family homes owned by corporations, not people. And Atlanta is the number one location for these houses in the entire country, according to GSU professor Taylor Shelton. Just a decade or so ago, none of these companies even existed. But a recent study found that just three companies, known to customers as Progress Residential, Invitation Homes, and Main Street Renewal, own more than 19,000 homes in the metro area. The homes that most of these companies are, are buying are <clears throat> exactly the kind of starter homes that 15, 20, 30 years ago would have been first time home buyers. And in certain areas, these corporations can own most of the homes in a neighborhood. Take this street where every single house you see is owned by invitation homes, built to rent and not to buy, impacting the entire market as a whole. It makes it impossible to find a deal. Jordana Haig says the end result has led to higher prices as corporations have bought up much of the supply of homes, pushing up house prices while also allowing them to control the rent. So ultimately is to take your ability to have ownership away. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like these private equity firms are really just an enemy of the people. Um, your thoughts game? Uh, bring out the guillotines, I guess. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, man, like um, my city is just ridiculous. Like it's expanding so much and like all these new little suburbs, man, like I swear, like only like a third of them are available to buy. And like the other two thirds part of that little suburb, it's all rent, man. You can only rent. And um, I'm worried like what I if I'll ever be able to own a home. Um, I'm not good at saving money. I don't make a ton. Um, 
And it's like, yeah, it is definitely worrisome that uh, my girlfriend and I can like, get a house at some point. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. That sucks. So let me share this really quick. Um, this uh, just a little bit because a lot of times people are going to go, well, you don't have to worry because if you don't own it, then that means that the responsibility is on the landlords to be able to make sure that the house is maintained, right? Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's go. This video is entitled, I Investigate America's Most Evil Slumlord. Here's what happened. I'm not even going to play this entire thing, but it's bad. It's bad. The outlets weren't working. Our ceiling fan had caught on fire. That's all you got to do. Rats and roaches for three years. You know, I can't, I can't imagine having the same issue this summer where it gets up to 96 degrees and now I have a baby and having to be stuck in the house. I'm waiting for one of us to just fall through a floor. It felt like a halfway house. I hate to say it. They know, like they know there's nowhere we can go. This entire neighborhood behind me is owned by one giant mega corporation that's run by a super secret private equity investment firm. So Progress Presidential is owned by a private equity firm and owns tens of thousands of single family homes across the US. A Tampa Bay Times analysis found that Tampa Bay's housing market is becoming increasingly corporate owned. It's not uncommon to see entire blocks bought up by corporate investors. Large companies have amassed around 27,000 homes in the region. And more than 70% of these properties are linked to institutional investors with ties to Wall Street and private equity firms. This is one of the neighborhoods that investors have really targeted. They're coming in, they're buying it at cash, and then they're going to hold them as rentals. In January, 33% of all homes purchased in the U.S. were bought by investors, often Wall Street-backed companies with multi-billion dollar funds, and rent them out, in some cases, to the very families who dreamed of owning them. Well, that is not ideal, is it? No, it is not. <laughs> Let's go into uh Let's go into this here about the renters and former employees speaking out. They exploded us to die. I spoke to a number of current and former tenants of Progress Residential and they told me the problem started right from the get-go. The issues arose when we had AC outages. Um, and it was like the dead of summer in Florida, so really hot, unbearable. Our inside our house got up to 96, um, and we were waiting days for them to come out. Throughout that first week of us like trying to unpack, we were finding more and more problems that like were listed as things that were supposed to have already been fixed before we moved in. The banister was not attached properly, and like going up and down the stairs was dangerous. There's just tile that's like not attached to anything. There's just outlets that are just out of the wall. The garage door just had giant gaps on either side. Anyone could have just taken a crowbar and just kind of popped their way into our garage. According to this 2023 report put out by Private Equity Stakeholder Project, a nonprofit private equity watchdog, whistleblowers from within Progress Residential have alleged patterns of harmful neglect. We had these wasps. So it just goes to show, sorry to pause on that part, but it just goes to show that corporations will always try to cut corners. And when cutting corners, it always leads back to you getting screwed over because they don't actually want to spend the money on doing things properly, especially when it comes to safety and regulations. Look at, look at what they're doing to these tenants. They're, they are slumlords. And what do slum, why don't slum lords want to make sure the house is taken care of? It's because they want to keep as much money in their pocket as possible. That's how capitalism operates. Renovations? What a silly thing. How stupid to them. It's like raising rent because they need to buy another boat or, you know, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. just chilling on the yacht, screwing us over, man. It's really. Really fucked up. I do pest control too, man. So I go in and out of houses, like, um, and I deal with landlords and stuff. And like, man, just sometimes I send a quote over to like seal some holes, and just like the responses I get, and just like the corners they want to cut, and and this customer will have like a rat infestation, you know, mm -hmm. like not just 
preventative, it's like there is a big problem. Like, I'm not talking about a roach or two, like rats. It's like these yeah. guys are just like so cheap and like landlords, man. They don't do nothing for nobody. <laughs> what, mm. There is no good from them at all. So, yeah. And just think about how, you know, a, a lot of people who did own a home back in 2008 and remember how, uh, you know, black uh, black wealth tanked under Obama. A lot of those black people that actually owned their homes and now they can't afford to own a home anymore because that home was actually taken away from them. And now they have to rent from these corporations. They, like, that's just horrible. And so now they're even more screwed, right? So let's share this. Where we were. Currently, the issue we have is our water here. So now we have hot water like for five minutes. Our showers are horrible. It's just really unprofessional. If I have to sum it up in one word. And these experiences that we've heard today from Caitlin, Amber, and others are not isolated incidents. One former Progress Residential employee said that upper management ignored their concerns regarding staff shortages and frequently pressured staff to deny or delay maintenance requests. Quote, it is all about their bottom line. And if what the resident is needing does not fit their bottom line, forget about it. It's not happening and it doesn't matter how big the issue is. Working for them, I was in the evictions um, collections area and how they were doing invoices was not correct. They will lose payments and then say it was your fault. And then here comes the astronomical late fees and charges and things like that. It was horrible. Like they don't clean um, for tenants to, you know, move right in, no issues. If anything were to happen, you have to make a work order. You won't hear from maintenance for like four to six weeks. If that, I had to quit because the last four checks of my employment was incorrect. I was doing overtime and then they were double taxing the money that was paid out. <laughs> and then our bonus structure still wasn't paid out. And then our quote, quarterly bonus, we never saw it. The government needs to honestly step in and audit the hell out of these people because honestly they take and don't give. It's a lot of rules that they're not following. Alleged property neglect, junk fees, frivolous evictions, targeted exploitation of the less fortunate and potential cases of employee wage theft among other payroll and labor violations on a systemic basis. Such are the hallmarks of a Wall Street landlord. It's so basically, they even treat their employees like crap. So you can say, oh, well, you know, they, you know, the employees are probably well taken care of. No, they're not. Private equity doesn't care about employees. They don't care about customers. They don't care about you. They don't care about me. I wonder if they even care about their kids. Paid maternity leave, paid vacation, paid time off. Like, that's just such a nuisance to them. And, yeah, I'm sure yeah. they don't get treated well at all. Yeah. And that video is really great because it also definitely shares about, you know, what's going on with private equity. Uh, I can't, you know, show that entire uh, video, but, you know, just so that you guys, you know, have that. Uh, let me share that with you guys in the chat so you guys can have that access to that video. But one of the things that I want to focus on, because a lot of times we talk about the issues, we talk about the problems, right? One of the things that I want to focus on is what are the solutions to what we can do? Because a lot of times we'll talk about the problems and we'll say, yes, this is a huge problem. And that's a huge problem. And what, what do we do in order to not be so depressed? once you walk away from my stream. So, we know, you and I know that we can't depend on politicians, right? We can't, like, I can't go to Maxwell Frost and be like, hey man, we, we gotta do something about these private equity firms because I know that nothing's gonna happen with him, right? You know that nothing's gonna happen with, I don't, I don't know who your particular uh, congressperson is, but can you really depend upon them? 
Man, Michael McCall, I think, is my congressman, and he's like one of the richest congressmen. He's, he's like a quarter of a billion dollars, dude. Oof. It's Yikes. ridiculous. And um, just by chance, dude, I did pest control at his house, and I'm not going to go into details, but it's like two football fields, man. It's This guy is just like, yes, dude. It's like sick view of downtown. It's insane. Like, and I wonder how he voted on that TikTok bill. I didn't check on that. But, um, yeah. But, um, <clears throat> yeah. So let me share this because one of the things I think is important is that, yes, get out into the streets. Um, I, I want to do a stream on RBN about how to start mutual aid organizations or getting into and trying to find different mutual aid organizations and organizations to do actions on the ground because building dual power is one of the most important aspects of trying to change the system at its foundation so that's one another thing is to try to circumvent the politicians so that we can actually have something better for ourselves or to try to mitigate damage done to working and poor people. One of those ways is through doing ballot initiatives. Now, shout out to Roger Meadows for this. Uh, here is an article of how ballot measures get on the ballot. And I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but I wanna read some of it just so that you guys can get uh, an idea this can hopefully encourage you to do things, say, for instance, outlawing private equity out of healthcare or outlawing private equity out of owning homes, right? How many people would benefit from, oh, you explain to them what private equity is and how it screws them over. And then you get these, all these signatures, it gets on a ballot and then it gets passed in your state, right? So let's take a look here. So. It says, when voters go to the polls, they not only vote on political candidates, but also ballot measures. Most voters don't know where they stand on the measures, but how much is thought is given to how they made it onto the ballot in the first place. To answer this question, one must first define a ballot measure. A ballot measure is a proposed law, issue, constitutional amendment, or a question that appears on a statewide or local ballot for voters of the jurisdiction to vote on. In the United States, a ballot measure can make it on to the ballot through one of three means, citizen initiative, legislative referral, or automatically in some states. Each state has different requirements to get an issue to appear on the ballot. However, most ballot measures are placed on the ballot through citizen initiatives or legislative referrals. So it goes over state by state, which one is which. So this one goes into citizen ballot, me ballot measures. Citizen initiative allows citizens to propose a constitutional or statutory amendment or a veto referendum for inclusion on the ballot. This can be a direct or indirect means, both of which require citizens to collect a specific, specified number of signatures prior to being placed on the ballot. Citizen initiated ballot measures were first adopted by South Dakota in 1898. So it talks about how 26 states in the District of Columbia have adopted the citizen initiative process. So, talks about 18 allow for citizen initiated constitutional amendments, 21 allow for citizen initiated constitutional amendments, the state statute, and then Maryland and New Mexico allow for veto referendum referendums, but not initiated state amendments or statutes. So, then it goes over the processes here, right? We're not going to read the entire thing. And then you got legislatively referred ballot initiatives. Another common method of placing a measure on the ballot is through legislative referral. A legislative referral ballot measure is an issue, question, or law that appears on the state or local ballot due to a vote by state legislators. So I want to share this with you guys, and this actually goes over who has citizen initiative, legislative referral, or veto referendum, or if they have all three. So it shows who has it. And there's multiple states that have it. And listen, if you guys want to, you guys can go over this. Maybe, you know, form a group, see what you guys can do in order to try to draft something to push so that private equity is outlawed in different sectors of 
our states in order to mitigate the damage done to workers. So these are some of the ones. And even if you don't vote for a particular politician, that is okay. Keep in mind the ballot initiatives in your prospective states that also mitigate the damage done to workers so that we can push for something better. It's not going to be the end all be all, of course, but it will help mitigate some of the damage to fellow workers out there. And so I just wanna make sure that I put this out here too, so that you guys get this and possibly help your fellow neighbors in this way. Uh, so like for instance, we're gonna be uh, voting on a ballot initiative here in Florida that legalizes cannabis on a recreational level. Imagine what we could do if we legalized it. You know, imagine, like, look, we, we legalized $15 an hour minimum wage. We actually passed that in 2022. Cannabis isn't legal in Florida? Is that what you said? Cannabis isn't legal in Florida? It is illegal on a recreational level. Now, we do have it legalized for medicinal. Hmm. But the last step is recreational. And what if we actually passed that in November through citizen ballot initiative? That's direct democracy. I'm gonna look into this website. I haven't heard of the council of state governments. This is pretty cool. At it. Yeah. I'm gonna bookmark this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I'll do is uh, for, for this, uh, let me also share this into, I'll put this in a private chat for you just in case you wanna take a look at it too but about the about initiatives too. But yeah, and you said you're in Texas, right? Yeah. Okay, let me take a look at Texas real quick. Uh, Texas is, yeah, they're only legislative. But that's something, right? Uh, and here in Florida, somebody like me, is yes, I can do citizen ballot initiatives. So it depends, but different people can do different things, right? Especially for trying to mitigate that horrible things that these capitalists are trying to do to us. So I don't wanna leave people with just, oh, well, you know, you, you know, we just talk about the problems. What about the solutions? We have solutions out there that we can do. Is there any other ideas that you may have that other people can do? Uh, just educate, man. That's, that's, talk to your friends, family, neighbors, and just um, your neighbor's not your enemy. Um, and then definitely as much mutual aid as you can. Um, I'm not the best with that. I definitely need to learn more about that in my city. But um, definitely take care of yourself. Um, you know, eat good. Eat, eat raw foods. Um, I'm not a health nut, but like I'm definitely staying away from processed foods and I'm drinking more tea and going to the gym. Definitely take care of yourself because I definitely feel 10 times better like, um, you know, doing all that stuff. So you got to, if you're going to take care of other people, you got to take care of yourself. So definitely eat good, smoke good if you're into that. But yeah. Of course, of course, smoke me gun. Uh, so. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses, and have a beautiful day.